Right, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, politics, uh, policy exchange fringe meeting on financial and banking reform. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see all of you here today. My name is Anis Tahith, I'm the editor of City AM, and I'm going to be uh, chairing today's session. Um, we've got a group of really excellent speakers for you here today, so I'm going to very quickly introduce them and then uh, we will kick off with uh, all the speakers uh, giving their views in turn. And after that, we have a QA. Uh, where we'll be able to be more informally discuss uh, the issues that are being raised today. Um, so starting uh, on my right, on my right, uh, got Xavier Bollet, who, uh, as you know, is the new CEO of London Stock Exchange, and who's emerged as um, a great voice speaking up for the city and for uh, free market economy at a time when a uh, few other people are doing that. And Xavier is French and used to work for various U.S. institutions um, before uh, moving back to London. Um, Next is Andrew Tirry, um, the chairman of the Treasury Select Committee and the MP for Chichester. And Andrew's already emerged as a formidable voice questioning and scrutinising uh, our financial institutions and monetary policy. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. Uh, on, my, on my left is um, Vicky Ford, Conservative spokesman on economic affairs in the European Parliament and a former banker herself. Um, Gerard Lyons, uh, Chief Economist and Head of Research at Standard Chartered, um, the global bank based in London and which did not need a bailout, uh, unlike some of the others. And uh, on my far left, Andrew Lillico, who I've known for years, the Chief Economist of Policy Exchange, and he was previously uh, the Managing Director of Europe Economics. So it's a great uh, group of people, and um, you know, finally, you know, have we thrown out the baby with the bathwater? That's a fundamental question now, I think, at a time when you know, there's evidence that there's a trickle of hedge fund managers leaving the UK. The latest estimates are that about a thousand have left already, costing this cheque about 500 million pounds in foregone revenues. You've got a bunch of other companies leaving. There's a lot of people who are very worried now in London's financial services industry and who are you know, wondering whether they need to relocate out of the UK, out of the European Union altogether, and a lot of other fears about every regulation and that you know the banking regulation may be the case of overkill and so on. So without further ado, we will start with um, Andrew Tiri. Thank you very much. Um, well, the first point I'd like to make is I've learned to arrive early at these functions, policy exchange. Um, the time I got here at 20 past, all the sandwiches had gone. Yes. Uh, and um, it only shows the, the keenness of your of your appetites, if not for me, for, uh, and us for, for the food at the back. And, uh, and also, of course, we've been competing with George, um, and we seem to have done fairly well even despite that. Um, before I go any further, I will say one or two things that are maybe construed as critical of the banks. Um, I think that this raw banker bashing that we've had for quite a while has gone quite far enough. I think it's gone too far, uh, and we need now to look in a more <coughs> mature and um, dispassionate way at the uh, causes of this crisis if we're going to find uh, solutions. Um, I'll come on to what I mean by solutions <coughs> in a moment. So I'm going to divide my remarks into two parts. First of all, why did uh, what we had before fail, and secondly, Will it, anything else do much better? Uh, on the first question, um, we need to remember that in 1997, between then and 2000, the whole of the regulatory structure of the city was torn up and reconstructed. And it is that system that has <coughs> failed. And some illustrations of the failure are no liquidity statistics were collected for the banks by the regulators it was and initially a liquidity <coughs> crisis which hit the banks. Basel II, well the whole Basel process, I sometimes wonder, uh, perhaps slightly mysteriously, whether any of that's worth the candle, uh, proceeded at a tortuously so pregnant pace and it uh, appears to have achieved very little. Um, <coughs> the whole of the court, the edifice of corporate <coughs> governance and the combined code was also shown to be severely deficient. The um, shareholders did not bark, bark via their representatives, that is, uh, the non-executives on the boards of these banks. 
and of course the centerpiece of the structure for dealing with systemic risk, uh, the so-called tripartite, scarcely met, failed to monitor very uh, much, and initially was hopeless uh, when a crisis struck. So moving swiftly on, I think we're agreed what we've got or what we've had in the past uh, is not up to the mark. The question is, uh, could we do any better? even to solve the last crisis, never mind the next one, which is always the problem in this field. Well, there are some things I think we could do, and I, went, I was told to speak for only five, seven minutes, and I'll just throw out a few thoughts. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with a qualification for all those thoughts. The first is, I do think we can improve surveillance of uh, the banks. We didn't have enough information about what was going on in the banks, and we need to collect more intelligently the information uh, that we do obtain. And it's up to the regulators to think much more constructively about this, while always bearing in mind um, that they should not delude themselves. And I worry occasionally when I hear one or two remarks of regulators uh, not a long way away from the FSA. Um, that they may be um, in danger of deluding themselves that they can price risk better <coughs> at any particular uh, time uh, than the people uh, who are creating and selling products. <coughs> the second thing I think we can do is use a variety of tools right across the piece, uh, not uh, home in necessarily on one particular uh, solution. Among those tools are capital ratios, living wills, uh, better treatment of subordinated debt, and some consideration of more radical structural <coughs> options at the far end of the spectrum of which, or towards the far end of the spectrum of which, is narrow banking. I thought the Banking Commission report was particularly significant uh, in flagging up the possibility of finding ways of delivering benefits through changes in the structure that fall short of full cleavage of the existing banks. <coughs> the third thing we need to do is to have a very clear chain of command, not only for uh, <coughs> um, trying to prevent a crisis, but for <coughs> crisis management once it starts. We must have one man in charge, and we didn't have that in this crisis. We had statutory independent bodies um, and people with different responsibilities protecting their patch. Um, that is the story of the Northern Rock uh, episode. The Financial Stability Committee there is certainly a way forward. My own view, and I've expressed this vigorously in the House and elsewhere, is that a um, straightforward way of making sure everybody understands who's in charge is, if, is to have a simple rule that if the taxpayer's money is being considered for being put at risk at any point for dealing uh, with a crisis, uh, that the Chancellor of the Exchequer should become the formal chairman of that committee, should take over chairman. Then we know who's in charge. I had a ringside seat, although I had no influence over a, 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 another massive uh, financial uh, crisis, the handling of that financial crisis, which was uh, the BP flotation in 1987 when stock uh, market values fell 25% around the world overnight. And of course, people think that was all okay because the required action was taken. But if it hadn't been, that could have spun off into a much, much more serious crisis. What I saw there was that I had no influence on events. And I can take no credit for the decisions that were taken. Um, was that we had one man in charge, and it was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He overruled the Bank of England in the space of 48 hours, took extremely tough action, um, and it turned out that the action he took uh, was broadly right. Um, the fourth thing, paradoxically, I think we need to do <coughs> is, and people normally see these as contradictions or as ten uh, tension between the two, is we need to increase competition in banking. Uh, it is generally held, well, the more regulation you have, the less competition you have. And of course, that's true, because regulation is a barrier to entry. But it's also true that greater competition forces better pricing of risk 
um, in higher risk products if shareholders uh, and bondholders um, have uh, high quality information about what that risk consists of. And that is where competition can come in. I might say a few more words about that in a minute, but I'm very pleased that the Banking Commission uh, has um, not only obtained uh, in its terms of reference competition, but it's also, as we've seen from its initial 50-page publication, determined to work on this uh, vigorously. I said, I've ne mentioned a few things which no doubt will raise questions and arguments and others will want to build on or will disagree with, but I just want to end with one general qualification which I promised to do at the start which is let's be realistic about what is achievable. We don't have <coughs> any type of regulation, any creativity in the financial services sector may reduce risk, but it may increase risk and in, w in ways which are unforeseen and unforeseeable. And that creativity is not something um, that we uh, can afford across the board to stifle. It will cost us. The second point uh, to make is that the consumer always pays for this regulation and before we um, heap more regulation on the banking sector we need to be clear in each extra heap of that regulation uh, that we are getting uh, value for money in terms of reducing <coughs> we don't want more window dressing regulation that achieves little and the third point that I want to make uh, uh, by way of qualification uh, and there have been some very strange things said with, with regard to this with which I disagree is the business cycle is always with us and with it the financial cycle we will not eradicate we will have difficulty even in attenuating the financial and, and the business cycles the best we can do I think is to identify where those risks are as early as possible and have preparatory action in place. Wary always of the inevitability that the next financial shock, whether it, whether it is in five or 25 years time, will come from a quarter that we cannot at present forecast. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, we're going to have to keep all the uh, next presentations quite strictly, so uh, five to seven minutes. Um, Xavier, do you want to be next? I'm going to be down to about a minute and a half. <laughs> but thank you very much. These, these points, I think, are all well taken. Um, and, and I think right on the mark. Uh, where are we today? Why are we where we are? And, uh, if one looks back at the financial crisis of the last 100 years, whether we go back to the late 20s, and mid 30s, or a bit more recently, late 70s, 84, 87, 90, 94, 97, 98, 2000, 2001, and now this, this, this massive uh, financial crisis. It's always the same reason. And it's just one. It is excessive leverage. And our inability to manage <coughs> leverage in a proper fashion. And then when we look at regulation, I think it's important that we determine whether we want to look back towards the past, sort of lessons learned, or whether we're going to look to the future at ways that we can lessen the, the reliance of corporate UK, or in fact any um, uh, country's uh, 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 corporate investment, on bank lending. <coughs> and the inability to manage leverage at the aggregate level, whether at government or at the macro level, effectively central bank, which is what happened in the United States from sort of 87 until now. Uh, the political resolve to avoid recession at any cost would led to basically overly accommodated loose monetary policies, combined with <coughs> corporate governance failures at a number of institutions, namely banks. What do banks do? They manage leverage. They create something out of nothing. And this is good when it's done in the right way. Uh, even today, we're looking at Europe as a whole, and the UK in particular, three quarters of corporate funding comes from the extension of leverage by the banks. So to the point of, of looking at banker bashing and perhaps putting a stop to it, this is really important. We need bank finance to restart the economic engine, particularly as regards SME financing today in the UK and within, within, uh, within Europe. 
But the third point also is that there were supervisory failures, regulatory failures. And, and here we've seen, I think, in the UK as well as elsewhere, the dichotomy, the separation, the hiatus between the regulation of balance sheet, counterparty risk, effectively prudential regulation, and the regulators who were providing it. And I think we've called it the London Stock Exchange, even under the, the previous administration, for the separation at the regulatory level, the regulation of prudential risk from the regulation of behavioral risk. And I think we have the right framework now in the UK. So looking to the future, what is the right balance in terms of regulatory reform? We believe the right regulatory reform is the one that will enable finance as a whole, not just the banking system, to do what it was designed to do, which is funnel money from where it is to where it's needed. And in that context, I think it's very important that behavioral regulation remain unified. Going back to the fragmentation of regulatory responsibilities, almost a sort of tripartite type system, sort of too many cooks in the kitchen will not be useful. In fact, may even be dangerous. So we believe at the London Stock Exchange very strongly you know, powerful prudential regulator on one end, but on the other hand, a powerful behavior regulator. And this is important because if we want to lessen reliance on bank funding, you know, in good times, in times of economic growth, bank leverage or leverage of bank balance sheets is the quickest and cheapest and most efficient way to get capital in the hands of entrepreneurs. In bad times, like today, when banks go into reverse leveraging, when they are hoarding cash and assets, collecting money from the central banks and lending that same money to the same central bank. We take considerable amounts of money out of the funding cycle of the economy. So we need to, we need to look like, and this is what regulations, we believe primary goal should be, at growing a hedge to that bank reliant funding system, i.e. developing forms of channeling funds into the hands particularly of small and mid-sized enterprises that will be effective. And in terms of the right balance, and this will be my concluding point, we think if we, and we strongly subscribe to the sort of Twin Peaks approach of this government, we think it's also very important that whatever we end up with is well aligned with that of our fellow regulars, regulators in the United States, and particularly in Europe. If we do not have the expertise and the culture to defend the UK's corner in Europe, we will be cherry-picked. And that is not just speeches and visits and phone calls to European commissioners and ministers. It's, partici it's participating in the daily ground of committee work within the new European structure. It is binding on the UK. The UK represents two thirds of financial services industry in Europe. But in many of the European regulatory, for example, the new European Securities Markets Authority will only garner 8% of the votes. So it's very important that at a working level, in terms of committee memberships, we have the right representative who can do the technical work to protect and promote the United Kingdom's financial services industry because what it does is it funds and will fund the recovery, particularly in the SME sector. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, next week, Vicky Ford. Thank you very much for that, and I hope I am one of the right members of that committee. Um, just from a personal point of view, um, the British Conservative Party has got four members on that committee, myself and Case Swinburne, um, four members, and then Saeed Kamala, Ashley Fox as the other two. And we do work incredibly closely with Sharon Bowles, the committee chair from the um, Liberals. So that's great at the moment to have her in that position. Um, I want to go in a bit of the detail of, of the legislation that's coming in front of um, the European Parliament, but before that, just two basic points. Uh, we are very far from out of the economic crisis. The point that you made about access to capital, especially for SMEs, is a key concern not only here but across the continent and elsewhere. And in my view, the banking crisis is not over. The wake-up call that we saw from AIB last week showed that still taxpayers are having to bail out banks. <coughs> and I never want to be in the position again where UK taxpayers have to bail out the banks. Okay. Um, I do see the City of London as a national treasure. It is um, a really precious thing that we have the world's largest financial centre. 
we need financial services, we need banks lending money, we need pension funds looking after our pensions, we need insurance companies <coughs> that will pay out when there's a crisis. We need liquid markets to allow that all to happen. And yes, occasionally we do need derivatives as well to hedge those risks when they arrive. Um, nice to see the thumbs up. However, it is a treasure that brings risks. Because we have the City of London, we have more open doors to other countries than any other place in the world, especially given the size of our economy. So if there are problems in financial services elsewhere, they impact us. We therefore cannot pass the buck when it comes to legislation. We cannot continue to say, oh, the entire crisis caused by the US subprime lending. Let's remember that a significant amount of that repackaged debt was traded through the trading floors in the City of London or by institutions that had um, subsidiaries or affiliates in the city. So we need to be at the forefront of global legislation, which we are. But I also agree with Andrew what he said about <coughs> Basel, that what's the point in getting to accords in Basel if they never get implemented internationally? American banks, listen to that, please. Um, so what we're doing in the European Parliament is ensuring that those bits of legislation are agreed internationally. That's really embarrassing because that's my phone. That's American Bank's policy. That's my policy advisor just sort of telling me off. Okay. Um, it switched off, so sorry about that. Um, in terms of the European Parliament, I stopped counting when we saw the 50th bits of legislation or <coughs> coming through the table, coming across the table. But I do look at those bits of legislation in three different sort of pockets. There's a need to have area. How do you address the causes of the crisis, such as bank capital? Um, and the sum of it is sort of helpful to have. How do you try and stop systemic risks in other places? So transparency and derivatives, for example, I would put in the helpful. And some of it is purely politically motivated legislation and a backlash. So um, it's stopping that backlash, but also um, making sure that the need to have um, bits work. On the need to have, the bank reform is, in, in my view, as a former lender, absolutely critical. Um, and we now have the best capitalised banks in the world, in the UK. I am an extremely sad attention to detail person, and I walk around Parliament with the results of the stress tests of European banks in my folder. Um, and I can tell you that the average stress tests for the UK were well over 10%, way ahead of any of the others. Okay? Recent analysis, though, that Morgan Stanley showed me is that actually the cost of borrowing for a bank within Europe is not dependent on how well capitalised you are, but at the moment, totally correlated with your sovereign credit rating because the markets believe that bad banks will still be bailed out. So we had these negotiations at Basel where everyone was meant to agree level playing field for new capitalization of our banks. But what I see going around the parliament is everybody trying to get their little exemption in for their little national bank. So um, the Germans have um, put in exemptions for fan briefing. There's a nice Austrian exemption for minority interests. Um, and you can just go down and say, which bank are you trying to help here? I don't think that's helpful. And I think when we have this debate, we have to have it properly impact assessed so that we can look at the cost of these new rules for the wider economy. However, I don't think the banks are being helpful in that the impact assessments are so tied up in confidentiality agreements, we as legislators can't get to see the numbers. So we need to have a much more open and transparent discussion about these impacts. Um, again, on the bonus legislation, which I know the city is now looking at implementing this much more quickly, that sort of fell somewhere between my need to have category and the purely politically motivated backlash discussions, depending on what was happening in the room at the time. I, I would contend that you need to have a complete look at the risk remuneration matrix. We all know that. Um, but if the banks had acted in a bit more of a mere helpful way in last year's bonus rounds and helped us to come up with suggestions of how to write that risk remuneration language better, we would have ended up with probably a much um, easier to understand <coughs> document than the one that eventually came out of the European Parliament. Um, also in the need to have, I would agree with Andrew on corporate governance, the responsible lending stream, we do need to look at that, and the bank resolution. In the helpful to have stream, 
is the derivatives, but this is where we need to really think about unintended consequences. Because the recent IMF working paper suggested the amount of under collateralized derivatives across the world is a number of roughly two trillion, okay? And you suddenly take that size number and ask players, pension funds, insurance funds, as well as banks, to collateralize those risks, you're talking taking a large amount of money out of the markets. And then you say that's got to be collateralized with liquid assets. What's a liquid asset? That's sovereign debt. Well, I'm afraid we already know that um, allowing banks to use all that sovereign debt um, as zero risk weighted capital just bumped up the market for sovereign debt and gave a lot of countries the idea that, that there were people who wanted to buy their debt when they didn't really want to. So um, we need to completely rethink the definition of what's a liquid asset and make sure it's not encouraging the sort of false demand for sovereign debt. Um, the purely politically motivated category um, is, I think, the AIFM directive is in this area. I would contend that it, we need to look at the hedge funds, we need to look at private equity, we need to make sure that you don't get another systemic risk bubble building up outside the banking world. And it has been actually very helpful for those industries to have a platform to say this is the valuable thing that we offer to society. <coughs> Um, but the absolute blatant protectionism by the French um, that's come to try and stop passporting I think is wrong and I think the UK was absolutely right to block that when it went head on head last week. <coughs> I think it would be in a way a shame if we didn't get to a conclusion on that directive because I think we do need to have um, some, some rules, maybe to take the US approach more. But if we don't get to a conclusion in the first round, then it will then go second, third hearing, and it could be many, many years. So let's see how that goes, but at the moment we need to continue to fight for that passport. Um, to sum up, I would say, has the baby been thrown out with the bathwater? Not yet. I don't think that happened in the supervisory architecture package, but I do know that a lot of the arguments that we were having in that architecture package, um, which would pass a lot more decision making <coughs> over to European authorities, away from the City of London and away from the UK, those arguments will now appear in other directives. So we fought the battle and won the battle in the first round in the detailed negotiations. We need to continue to do that again. Um, I think that to get good legislation on financial services, the financial community needs to be much more involved. I would like to see more suggestions from yourselves as to how we implement good language. And we need to look, for example, with CRD3, for example, with the derivatives language, to get positive suggestions. Um, and as my final plea, is let's have a bit more transparency from the financial services community on the impact assessments with the numbers. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Joan Byron. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, just to say, Standard Chartered is delighted to be associated with policy exchange in putting on um, this seminar this lunchtime. And we've worked closely with regulators overseas as well as here in the UK. In answering the question, has banking regulatory reform fallen short or gone too far? My feeling is that what's been proposed to date seriously challenges or disadvantages international banks like ourselves, Standard Charter, that operate in the city. And the real risk is that it points to a period of stagnation for the City of London compared to other international financial centres. And in an environment where the top 1% of earners pay 23% of the tax, we should not underestimate the implications for the UK economy. <coughs> but to actually look at the regulatory environment, I think we need to look very briefly at the economic lesson, the financial lesson, and the policy implications. And the three key words I would come out with are debt, liquidity, and incentives. In terms of first economic lessons, um, I would say we should not be surprised by this financial crisis. It was bigger on scale than the previous ones, but it is the fourth one the UK economy has had since the Second World War. The Maudley boom, the Barber boom, the Lawson boom, and now the Brown boom and bust all had the same underlying characteristic, too much debt. I think the key lesson I would argue that we should learn from the regulatory side is to look at other parts of the world. 
In particular, in Asia, macroprudential measures are very much seen as a key issue to prevent crises. Uh, the potential effectiveness of these, I think, is not fully appreciated. They're quite simple, they're quite effective, and they're very targeted. Loan to value ratios um, are a clear example. Um, <coughs> The housing market in the States, there was no regulation of mortgage lending in this crisis. Here in the UK, for instance, people were more readily willing to admit there could be a housing bubble, but even though we had greater awareness of the issue, we didn't really do anything about it. Macroprudential measures try to address the issue that the system amplifies risks. So the economic lesson is the whole debt issue, and therefore I would stress regulators should look at macroprudential measures. Second on the financial lessons, liquidity I think is the key issue, the need to have it. Not everything broke, even in the City of London. Um, RBS went up in sort of style, shall we say, um, a few others, HBOS, but when you, one looks at it, Barclays didn't do too badly, HSBC didn't do too badly, ourselves Standard Chartered, very global, we didn't do too badly. But actually in the rest of the city, the pension fund industry, the insurance industry, large parts of the city did come out of this crisis relatively well. Clearly they were hit by the recession. And I think we need to remember that, not everything broke in the city. We need to learn lessons from what went wrong as well as lessons from what went well globally as well as domestically. Internationally, Canada and Australia really did well because they had very effective supervision and Standard Chartered, in my view, is strict intrusive supervision is all to be welcomed. Indeed, transparency and simplicity and avoiding complexity may be one lesson we should take away. What broke? Liquidity. The institutions that failed didn't have liquidity. I also would argue they didn't have effective supervision from the regulatory authorities. Their internal governance and risk management really left a lot to be desired. Boards or senior management did not safeguard against excessive risk taking. What's interesting in our view is that what did not have an impact either on this crisis in terms of predicting this crisis? The structure or size of institutions. I would argue the debate over narrow versus investment banking is wrong. What happens is that the commercial banks like HSBC, Standard Chartered, who did well in this crisis, get penalised. Size is not the issue. You can try and have as many small firms as small banks as possible. You probably end up having them all doing the same and they probably will be hit by the same external shock probably would be hit by all doing the same thing wrong. Even capital is not the issue. The Institute for International Finance and others have many studies showing that if you put too much capital or put too much emphasis on capital, the real risk is that you limit the recovery. Third, and therefore, what are the policy lessons? I think it's vitally important that we do allow businesses and customers to take acceptable risks to promote growth. If you have no risk, I doubt if you would have much growth. We need to avoid the unintended consequences. I don't think anyone in this government, or in this coalition maybe, or maybe not, uh, want to really damage the city. But there's a danger of pushing things too far. Regulatory overkill is like tax overkill. <coughs> you only know when you've gone past the tipping point. Clearly we need to avoid cheap money. We need to learn the lessons from other parts of the world, such as supervision and macroprudential ne measures from Asia. The problem of moral hazard is a big issue. The credibility of a no bailout policy really can only be tested when it comes to the crunch. If you have small banks doing crowded trades, you probably would still have to bail them out. So what we really need to do is internalize the cost of failure such that it's not borne by the system. I think we're trying to do that, but that we have to accept that three years after the crisis started, instead of agreement on what caused the crisis, we now seem to have divergence. The kitchen sink is almost thrown into the debate. Also, three years after the crisis started, instead of international agreement, we, need, we now see divergent nationalistic policies. Too fast, too soon, too unilateral policies by the UK is a danger to the City of London. What we now have in the City of London is that no major firm is adding to staff in the city. The world economy is still doing pretty well. Additions to labour in the financial industry are taking place outside of the city. In terms of some of the international approaches, pay clearly is an issue. We need to make sure that people are not incentivised to actually bet the bank. Therefore, what the political debate has done on pay maybe should be encouraged. The tr trouble is, this is a G20 process and only one country, the UK, is adopting it. We therefore have to ask ourselves whether we're actually beating ourselves up too much. We clearly should be pushing for an international agenda 
but we shouldn't unilaterally take action that, in my view, discriminates or undermines the city, which is vitally important for the recovery. And finally, I think we do need to have a vision of where the economy goes in the future. We do need to have a balanced economy, but we need to have the right incentives coming out of the regulatory world. So, in conclusion, the three words I would say, um, debt, avoid it, liquidity, have it, and incentives, let's try and have the right ones. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. And our last speaker, uh, before we open up the floor to uh, questions, is Andrew Lillinger of on Policy Exchange. Right, so in my view, um, financial regulation, as currently conceived, goes far too far, or perhaps not nearly far enough, down the wrong sorts of paths, and barely scratches on the key things that need to happen. So I think your diagnosis of where you should go in terms of financial regulation depends very much on your diagnosis of the um, financial crisis and the bailouts that follow from it. So what's the problem, fundamentally, that the banks behaved in ways that meant that politicians then, <coughs> taxpayers and so on, had to bail them out? Or was the fundamental problem that either the politicians chose to bail them out or they didn't have mechanisms that could protect them from the need to bail them out? Could, could I ask, so, empty seats down there, and there's people who can't get in, could possibly people go and sit in the empty seats? Yeah, there's one, one or two, one or two empty seats here. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> okay. And may, maybe also worth moving slightly, a little bit in to the corridor side, side there. But sh let's. <coughs> shall we be brief about it, please? <coughs> we're up the speaker. We're okay. Is that better? There's one, one, one more here, one more here, and one there. One here, in front. <coughs> okay. All right, thank you. OK, Andrew, do you want to continue? OK, so the, I think that the current thrust of regulation assumes that the fundamental problem was the banks, whereas I think the fundamental problem lies on the side of the politicians. So if you, so what do bailouts, what's the, what's the problem with bailouts? Bailouts um, create incentives for, the, uh, for excessive leverage, uh, for excessive risk-taking, for excessive remuneration and excessively risk-oriented remuneration, and explosions in balance sheets that eventually imperil sovereign credit workers. <coughs> so they're pretty unattractive things to do. Now, what you might think is, look, what we can do is use regulation to counter all of those incentives. So we have all kinds of restrictions on um, capital levels, for example, to counter the uh, incentives to high leverage. Uh, we have restrictions on the activities of banks to counter the incentives towards uh, risk taking. Uh, and now, those, yeah, and, and a lot of the current focus of policy is going down these kind of paths. Uh, in essence, though, that is connected with the concept which says that banks failing, something, banks going bust represents some sort of failure of the system. And that's really a renunciation of capitalism. Because at the heart of uh, capitalism, there would be two kinds of propositions. And they're not the only two, but there are two of them there, which are that, first of all, that regulators, agents of the state, do not have sufficient information to know how to allocate uh, risk and uh, capital across the economy. And the second is that companies going bust is not a, some kind of failure of the system, it is a healthy feature of a system. It creates scope for new entry and um, uh, development of new ideas. So if we're not to go down that route of um, very great restrictions on activities, setting levels of capital so high that one hopes to eliminate all possibility of company failure, what can we do instead? Well, I think there's another way, right? We can have a mechanism that focuses <coughs> upon resolution and liquidity that increases the exposure of the key providers of capital to the banking sector and hence to the wider economy, namely the bondholders and the depositors, to genuine downside risk, to risk rates. <coughs> so central to the, um, so there is some, there are some measures that are going in this direction. There are measures in respect of special administration regimes and various concepts of how you might, uh, under special administration regimes, impose losses on bondholders. One of the most uh, interesting, one of the most straightforward of these, of course, is mechanisms by which you um, require that it, under special administration regimes. So what I mean by that is a regime such, say, same as would apply to, say, the water companies or the airports or things of that sort, where you don't allow them just to be liquidated, right? They have to be administered as going concerns. And what you do with the banking ones is that you require that after a time, the bondholders then have to swap some of their debt and turn it into equity. So the bondholders are forced to recapitalize the banks themselves. There are other things you can do, you can impose haircuts on them, but the, the heart of that is the idea that they have to make losses. 
Now, that's not the only kind of thing. I think in order for it to be credible that you impose losses on bondholders, you need mechanisms by, uh, that um, prevent politicians from being that guy, right? Nobody wants to be Fernando de la Rue, president of Argentina, taken off the roof of the presidential palace in 2002 with a baying mob outside <coughs> after he allowed the banking system to go bust and depositors to be losing their money. So how can you actually um, impose some losses on the bondholders uh, whilst and have some exposure of downside risk for the depositors whilst still not being faced with that threat of disorder. Well, I think you can do that. So I think the way of doing that is um, the following. I think that every bank licensed to accept retail deposits should be forced to offer a form of deposit account which is completely insured and completely backed by bonds, government bonds. So the, we used to have accounts of this sort. We used to have whole institutions that were called savings banks that existed from 1817 until the mid-1980s. Those sorts of institutions were chased out by a combination of high inflation and deposit insurance, which didn't exist in the UK till 1979. So what, what I think we need to do is to have that, uh, in, instead of re trying to recreate the past, instead we should nest one of these inside every standard fractional reserve bank. Then, if you want to go and just deposit money in the bank, you can deposit it in these entirely safe accounts without any limit to the amount of money that you place in them. So if you're moving house, you're not subject to some £50,000 restriction or something, and you sell your one property before you buy the next, you can put unlimited amounts in these things. But if you take your money and you put it in an investment deposit, then the bank can do what it likes with their investment deposit. If it wants to buy derivatives, equities, put money into um, shares. Of course, it can still be subject to prudential requirements and liquidity restrictions and some of the other kinds of things, I'm not suggesting eliminating all regulation, but you can then credibly expose those investment deposits, the clues in the name, it's an investment, right? You can ex credibly expose those to downside risk of loss. And I think that until we can find mechanisms, that might not be the only thing you can do, I'm just putting out that out there as one kind of a thing, but until you can find mechanisms that credibly expose the key providers of capital to genuine risk of losing their money, then you have a significant problem. You essentially don't have what we would normally understand as a capitalist system at all. So these are the ways you can go. You can find ways to expose capitalists to genuine downside risk of loss, or you can renounce private capitalism of the form that we've been used to. Those are the options. Right, well, on that store of choice, um, but as I said at the beginning of this session, uh, a great range of speakers, a great range of uh, very interesting ideas about where we are now and where the uh, situation should move forward. And um, what I will do is obviously a kind of question, so um, I think we'll just kick off with questions uh, immediately. And um, gentlemen over there, um, uh, if you, the rules are, if you could just say who you are and uh, who you represent, please, that'd be great. And also keep the questions reasonably short. Uh, Josh Spiro, editor of Spears magazine. Um, how important is public anger in regulatory reform? Right. Um, Andrew, <coughs> <laughs> well, as the committee, <coughs> which um, before the election was doing its best to act as a lightning touch basis for uh, public anger, I suppose I've had uh, some view on it. Um, the there are two things I'd say. First of all, without a shadow of a doubt, that if there hadn't been this public anger there wouldn't have been so much activity to try and get this um, uh, there wouldn't have been so much activity and that the kind of activity we've got now to try and resolve this would be different but secondly as we move out of this crisis and I know we've heard some negative remarks um, the sense uh, as that sense of crisis diminishes and distance opens up the political impetus for taking on powerful vested interest groups will diminish. So it cuts both ways. Um, it, public anger has played a role, will play a diminishing role, and the fact that it's that role will diminish um, has both good and bad aspects. Okay. Um, do you want to add something to this? Oh, well, I think the public are absolutely right to be angry as well. Um, because we became the unwilling shareholders in our largest banks and that's why we're going through the whole economic process in the UK at the moment. So I think public anger is important that it is listened to and I think it's important as I said earlier that 
those upon whom the light is shining, which is partly the politicians, partly the regulators, as well as the institutions themselves, come jointly to a solution to respond to those issues. The issue is when the public anger swings you off into actually kicking kickback regulation in the wrong part of the sector. So you're not solving the problem. But I suppose what one could say to that is that the public anger is indiscriminate, while a lot of banks were not bailed out, a lot of small institutions are not bailed out, and also there's sort of exaggerated rhetoric about uh, an entire industry rather than just a few people, and also the anger is not directed, for example, to central bankers who kept interest rates too low, and instead these central bankers are now gaining a lot of power. But anyway, um, <laughs> would you like to also add to that? Um, well, I concur with the point about central bankers. Um, but maybe in the last couple of years, I think we've had two parallel debates. We've had a technocratic debate, and unfortunately the technocrats or the bankers themselves involved in that have probably been too slow, which has allowed the other debate, the political public anger debate, very much to set the agenda. And the point on that, I would say, is that very much focus on two issues, on size and on pay. Both important, but not the most important issues. Okay, what I'll do now is I'm going to um, take a few questions one after the other one and then everybody will just answer them. Um, you're raring to go, I believe. William Salomon, hands up. Um, uh, just an investment firm. It is not one of the biggest problems that the people who take the risk with the capital don't own it. And when joint stock banks were created in the 19th century, that was the great crisis that was foreseen. And in the incentive system that has migrated from the investment bank trading houses into the clearing banks, you've incentivized people to maximize the risk of capital, which is not their own. So the solution must be personal responsibility when the banks get into trouble, so that people take risk with their own money as well as with the shareholders and depositors' money. So you advocate unlimited liability partnerships? No, a, a mixed structure. Okay, right, first question, a uh, gentleman there. Hi, uh, Connor Coleman, Lloyd's Banking Group. Uh, forgive me, this was, covered in one of the, uh, it, this was covered in one of the earlier speeches. I was wondering, how do the panelists feel about plans in the US and in the EU to put OTC derivatives on exchange? How do you think that will impact corporate people using derivatives for legitimate purposes? Okay, so OTC derivatives. Gentleman over there. Uh, Tom Smith, uh, HSBC. Does the panel think that um, the government's UK regulator, the UK regulatory reforms, place too much power in the Bank of England? Okay, and one last one, and then we answer those, and then return to the next ones. Uh, the lady over there. Um, yes, two years ago, the purity for appointed in the UK and Ireland. I want to ask Andrew if he thinks that Ireland should have abandoned the Anglo-Irish bond holders. A and B, whether he thinks that, or whether the panel thinks that there's any real legal, real impetus to reform the legal system to make it easier to uh, abandon bondholders <coughs> banks, um, and what implication that might have for sovereign regulation. Okay, so bondholders and whether they should lose out. <laughs> okay, well, that's a uh, full uh, set of questions. Um, shall we start off? Um, we'll just take everybody in turn and everyone can <coughs> give a quick answer. Let's start off with Andrew Lillico. So joint stock banks, OTC derivatives, too much power in Bank of England, and Anglo-Irish bondholders. So I don't agree with the. I, I don't agree about the joint stock banks. I think that um, I think that, uh, it's essential to capitalism that you have a separation of the capital providers and the capital managers, and there's no uh, no particular problem with that. It's provided that you credibly expose the capital providers to risk of loss. They're not forced to give these people their money to manage it. So if these people mismanage it and losing their money, that's tough. Uh, on the bondholders, uh, I would have. Um, so what I wanted to do in late 2008 was to uh, uh, overthrow most of the bondholding contracts across the financial sector and to impose um, depositors as preferred creditors of banks uh, and to impose losses on banks in going concern of um, for uh, under special administration regimes, which would be originally introduced. So that's what I'd have done then. Uh, that's probably what I'd still be doing now, uh, at least for the Irish. Um, it's there's a bit of a shame actually for much of the developed world. We've gone so all in on all of this that the op kind of options that we had for the use of government balance sheets um, in order to ameliorate some of the effects of that are now more limited. So it's arguable that we missed the window on, okay. on doing that. Okay, Joe. Any thoughts? Well, there's, um, some of the questions were pretty similar in terms of skin in the game would be the answer to the first and the last point. Yeah, and I think the lessons are that you, you need to have people having skin in the game. I would actually say that's a secondary issue. First, I would actually say the primary issue is to avoid getting to that situation in the first place. And if you have some of the simple structures, macroprudential measures, 
effective supervision, things we talked about on the panel, I don't think you need to get that far. But certainly if you do get that far, then yes. Uh, even make, pay has become an issue. Maybe having people paid in subordinated debt, not in equity even, so that people take the first hit if something goes belly up, I think is important. So yes, I would agree with both the first and last questions on that. Vicky Paul? Um, yes, it's important that the people taking risk have skin in the game. But on the other hand, who were the largest shareholders of Lehman? The people on the trading floor taking that decision. So it's not your only protection. Um, on OTC derivatives, we have, thanks, I have to say, to working extremely hard with the CBI and corporates across Europe, we have secured a, a carve-out for um, consumer end consumers, where it's non-financial services using derivatives to hedge risk. The issue that's concerning me now is when it's other financial services, not directly banks, but for example pension funds, who are also going to have a big impact here, and I don't think there's been enough focus on that yet. But you can thank the work for the Brits to get that carve out um, so far. Um, and um, should the bondholders have to take a loss? Yes. Okay. Now, I don't mind if that's all senior bondholders or if that's just increasing <coughs> tiers of some sort of junior bondholders but do you need a quick resolution that a bank if it's a systemic player can keep going as a made as a going concern and even actually if it's not a systemic player but it's a correlated with lots of small players as you said can keep going if necessary as a going concern but that investors can take losses yes you need that how far does those losses go? Should they go to depositors? Mm, I think you probably do need some protection for the man in the street. Is the protection level currently that's 100,000 euros too high? Certainly in some parts of Europe, that's incredibly high. And is there more <coughs> hazard in having that deposit guarantee? Yes, because it encourages you to go to the person who may be a poorly capitalized bank, but is offering the highest interest because you know the taxpayer <coughs> will cover you. So that is another issue as well, and they are all real issues that, that we are debating which could go one way or the other way. But the resolution mechanism to allow for creditors to take losses must happen because it cannot be the taxpayer. And we cannot afford to have a pre-funded bailout fund either. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrew, uh, yes, we need to find a way of penalising the bondholders. Um, your question is the the enduring quest question about modern capitalism, the division of uh, the risk takers from the owners. I think something can be done on corporate governance to improve that. Uh, I think the modern uh, pension funds of the institutions must play a greater role in appointing and monitoring the performance of non-execs. Uh, I've thought about this quite a lot, discussed it with Walker, David Walker. Um, in that area, there are reforms that can do something, although again, I'm pretty sanguine about just how much it can be achieved. The OTC market, if you try and kill off the OTC market, you will start killing off creativity or you'll have regulatory arbitrage taking these markets elsewhere. So one needs to be pretty cautious uh, about believing you can um, get it all out into a transparent exchange. Uh, it's a very complicated question which I can't answer in a few sentences. Bank of England too powerful. Um, Bank of England already is pretty powerful. <laughs> Having the bank, um, I mean, it was a, taking away the power from the bank was clearly the, the regulatory authority from the bank is clearly a mistake. Is giving it back now the right thing to do? Whether or not they deserve it, and they certainly deserve some criticism at the beginning of the Northern Rocket. So. Um, they are probably one of the few institutions left standing with some credibility, mainly because they have the reflected glory relative uh, that comes from having, broadly speaking, run the MPC okay. In one more sentence, I do concern myself about a related point, that there is a potential policy tension between the, the, the chairman of the MPC, that is the governor, wanting one policy stance at a particular time during a crisis, while the chairman of the Financial Policy Committee and the current, the current <coughs> also the uh, might conclude that he wants another policy stand. Okay, thanks. Xavier uh, Rowling? Um, you know, the point about risk-taking versus ownership of capital, and I think the point we've heard from Vicky around Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers not only have 
about 38 percent of the equity owned by employees, but he had by far the toughest lockup regime of any investment bank in the world. Five years, hard lockup. And so the alignment there was uh, the best you could find in that industry. But I think it was the point about Lehman Brothers and, and frankly, all the other investment banking, uh, uh, you know, large companies operating investment banking, was really a point about, and, and to me it's not so much about um, aligning the ownership of capital with the risk-taking activity. It's about actually knowing what your positions are. And frankly, and this is where OTC derivatives comes in, this is where moral hazard. The US investment banks, led by Lehman and others, uh, were leveraged um, in the mid-30s. Gross leverage ratios around 34, 35. And that's on the US gap. Had you restated those balance sheets using IFRS, the leverage ratios would have been in the mid 40s to low 50s. And then if you look at, it doesn't matter what you have. <coughs> if you leverage 40 to 50 times, it doesn't take anything in terms of modification in the value of your assets for you to wipe out to lose your capital. So it again boils down to leverage. And how can you control leverage when you don't know what you have? And <coughs> the regulators didn't. I can tell you the vast majority of the employees, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, had no idea what the balance sheet of these companies were and what was in it. And that is where regulation can make an impact. It's improving the transparency. It's actually knowing, and this is, this, there's been also a fundamental failure of our global accounting system to actually perform. Now, not that they were designed to do so, but they didn't capture the true nature and extent of the risk. <coughs> and so monitoring leverage is first knowing how much there is, and then determining <coughs> the, the limits to leverage. But that, of course, points to moral hazard. And I think it's the question today, should there be moral hazard or not? I think we've gone through that. The decision was made to let, and this is an unpleasant truth, the decision was made to let a bank with about $850 billion of balance sheet go bust, all right? Moral hazard. What happened? Armageddon. The consequences were so dire that all the other U.S. investment banks that were with Lehman Brothers in the bankruptcy lounge, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, that insurance companies like EIG and many others, the decision was not made to bail them out. They had to be bailed out. I think we're still working through this. So the question about moral hazard is a reasonably unpleasant one. It has been resolved. We can't afford to let these companies go bust. We couldn't then, and we cannot now. So the answer is how do we not get ourselves in that situation? But for sure, it's about regulating leverage. And for this, we've got to be able to know it, control it, and monitor it. I want to say a couple of words about OTC <coughs> OTC derivatives is 700, more or less, 700 trillion US dollar asset class. If you put together the capital value accessible to all the exchanges in the world, it's less than 100 billion. So how much leverage are you prepared to take by putting seven, let's, let's hypothetically took, take the 700 trillion in OTC derivative and ask an industry that is Let's, let's take the five largest exchanges in the world in terms of capitalization, and we're at less than 50 billion. You want to put 700 trillion onto a capital base of 50 billion? Now, what sort of crazy leverage is that? So there is a systemic risk issue. And frankly, we need to look at the way the clearing industry is regulated today. It is pretty highly leveraged when you look at the gross notional balance sheet. And so far, we haven't really looked at it. It has performed reasonably well during the crisis because it only handled one bankruptcy. So let's look at this going forward. We do believe that, um, as we've heard before from Andrew, I think, it was that the OTC world, the derivatives world, is very bespoke world. I mean, there is, I think I quote Jamie Dimon, who said that probably 75 to 80 percent of OTC derivatives were essentially standardized products. If you find the right risk framework, you may be able over time to migrate these products onto central clearing platforms, which will then give you visibility and a greater ability to price. One of the issues we had also with OTC products is we didn't know what they were worth. So they basically supported a balance sheet that no one could tell what that balance sheet was worth. So my concluding comment would be, let's look at this, let's be very careful, let's not stifle innovations, 
you know, the corporate world, I think, has reacted very briskly when the SEC in the United States said, let's put all OTC derivatives onto clearing houses or exchanges. Because corporates need that level of bespoke intermediation. So let's be careful. Let's do it over time. But it has to be a participation, cooperative work between the banks, the corporate world, and the clearing houses and the exchanges together with regulators. And then finally, if I may uh, be allowed, the point about prudential regulation moving into central banks. No one is perfect. They have the system, the capitalist system itself has its own frailties and imperfections. <coughs> but the only suitable, in our view, the only suitable regulator <coughs> balance sheet are regulators who know themselves balance sheet because they manage balance sheets. And it's about the knowledge of these products, but also the ability when something goes wrong and something always goes wrong to intervene. Not three months later, once you've gone back to Congress, remember the, 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 the TARP-induced volatility to the market? You know, substantial balance sheet companies were regulated by regulators who had access to zero capital. They could not intervene. The U.S. had to go back to Congress to design a new way to bail out these institutions. Investment banks became bank holding companies. TARP failed through its first passage to Congress. Remember the volatility in market. So you design the right framework in terms of prudential regulation. You have to have the right regulators who actually understand balance sheet. But if something goes wrong, the decision, going back to moral hazard, to bail or not to bail, has to be made that same day. And obviously by a regulator who have at their disposal vast resources if they are needed. Okay.